Welcome to a bonus episode of the Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and I'm a found footage fool. <laughs> Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. Hey everyone, uh, it's your old pal Bo here. It has been a while since we've done an official episode uh, to the tune of a month uh, because we were doing the 31 days of Halloween. I hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't, your long nightmare is over and we're back to regular episodes. Uh, we're going to kind of dip our, our toe back into the the dark parade pool a little slowly uh, and, and do a found footage full episode, but not just a single movie because you know it's been a while so let's enjoy ourselves let's indulge ourselves a little bit uh with some found footage and to that end we are going to talk about three count them three uh found footage movies this here episode one of them is uh a a little bit of a offbeat indie movie and the other two are are shutter releases so we'll start with the uh, the shutter releases, I think. But uh, anyway, so thanks again for all the uh, 31 days stuff. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for uh, being part of that. It was a lot of fun. Um, it's always a little bit of a bummer when it's over with, as it is today. Uh, uh, you know, the Halloween is behind us, and now I have to start looking forward to the next Halloween. Uh, but what are you going to do, right? Uh, plenty plenty coming up, uh, both on the Dark Parade. And just in general, just in life, right? Like, my last day of the job that I've had for 15 years is in just a few days. And that is both thrilling and terrifying uh, as I get ready to uh, start teaching. And uh, so, it is nice to just kick back and watch a, a handful of uh, found footage movies and and also nice that you know the universe or the good people of shutter depending on how you want to attribute this were kind enough to you know throw me a couple of, of found footage movies uh worth having a conversation about uh because these aren't the only found footage movies i watch but some of them you know you're like ah, i got nothing to say about this this is just kind of dumb oh I, this is just something i don't care for uh so let's do dead stream off the top uh, Deadstream uh, is a new movie released this year, as one of the others will be. Um, and it is directed by Joseph and Vanessa Winter, who uh, have done this. They did um, a segment for VHS 99 um, and then some shorts. And then a, a movie called, uh, let's see, I, let's see. Yeah, Wrath of the Dead, Cop vs. Robber, Abandoned in Space, There's Something in My Room. These are all shorts, and then Deadstream is their first feature. Um, and stars Joseph Winter in the in the lead role. And so the premise of the movie is there's a, a guy who makes his living being uh, like a YouTuber or Twitch streamer. Um, I, I feel like it's YouTuber is the more direct analog here um you know he's got one of those channels where uh he does dumb shit on the internet and i think it, the the channel is called like sean does it or something like that or watch sean do it anyway it's him doing you know ill-advised stunts and you know doing things that are potentially harmful to himself or just rude or whatever you know there's there's a bunch of them I have learned. Uh, that is not the corners of YouTube that I inhabit, but thanks to the boy child, I have learned that there is no shortage of YouTube channels uh, where people just do this kind of thing. You know, it's just how can we be audacious and it's got lots of quick edits and, I mean, it's just unendurable. It's, I don't even look at it as uh, uh, as entertainment but yeah people apparently make a living doing it and god bless them for it so this is what this guy sean does and uh in the process of that you, as the movie begins you understand that he has done something that required him to issue an apology and he is now trying to uh, he was deplatformed for a little while uh, couldn't monetize any of his videos and now he's trying to get his audience back. 
And to do that, he is going to spend the night in a notoriously haunted house. And as things go in movies like this, um, you know, he, he ends up uh, encountering real ghosts and real spirits and, and real stuff happens. And so, uh, you know, we, what we come to is a question of how effective is this? You know, we have, a, as it happens, a list of five criteria that we are going to apply to all three of these movies. And uh, so let's begin with number one. Uh, is the movie justified in keeping the camera on? And that's a big yes. You know, the the guy's whole channel is built around the idea of I'm keeping the camera on. I've got... Uh, a number of cameras set up. There are some stationary cameras in the house. There are cameras, what he wears on himself and, and some others. And so all that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and even the editing makes some sense because he's got, you know, an iPad with him that allows him to shift between those cameras. So you're sort of uh, seeing what he sees when he sees it. And all of that makes a, a fair amount of sense. So as far as keeping the cameras on, great. No problem. Uh, then we get to characters, and characters are a little different, but, uh, like, Sean is kind of an unlikable guy. And that's by design, though. You know, he is a bad person who is, is sort of coming to a reckoning uh, of sorts because of his shenanigans. And so you need him to be a little abrasive and audacious and um, a little smug and like all the things that make a character a little off-putting are the very reason that he would have an audience and um you know it, it's a, a fine line to walk of having a character that's not really a good guy but you also want your audience to root for him and i think for the most part um they pull it off the winters pull it off joseph and vanessa winter i, th I think that in the the writing of it they do just enough to make him sympathetic and i think joseph winter is you know like definitely playing it big uh, as as sean but i think you kind of need to and so i you know he's really it's it's kind of a one-man show there's him and then there's the you know invader to the set a girl named chrissy who we learn is not just who she seems to be um, and that, that is a very quick reveal. I'm not spoiling too much and I'm, I'm going to, uh, try not to spoil, uh, much at all. And, uh, the winners clearly like her because she shows up in the VHS 99 segment as well. And, and she's fun. Um, uh, and so I think the characters are for the most part, like they're not so off putting, uh, that they, they put you off the movie and they also, you also need an unlikable protagonist to begin with to see his journey from I'm, you know, I'm kind of a shithill who takes no accountability to I'm a shithill who takes some accountability. And and so that's something. Um, okay, so then we get to authenticity. Does this seem authentic within the world of the film? Uh, and, and it's important to make that caveat because this is a very silly movie. Um, it definitely borrows from Evil Dead to some extent. And, you know, it's it's a horror comedy. Uh, it, you know, Sean is a ridiculous character. He does ridiculous stuff. There's maybe one too many moments of him, like, rushing to a closet to hide uh, when he sees something scary for my taste. But for the most part, yeah, like, everything that happens within the film is legit and i and i think it speaking of authenticity it gets to a larger point which is about you know the this sort of youtube mentality or this youtube creator mentality that it doesn't matter who you hurt and it doesn't matter um what sort of you know societal ills that you perform so long as you're getting the clicks, so long as you're getting the audience. And that is, you know, like when Sean apologizes for the thing that you will find out he did, uh, his initial apology is a real like, hey, I'm sorry that anyone was offended by this kind of apology, that, that non-apology apology, where you're apologizing that other people were upset about it, but you're not actually apologizing for what you did. 
And so the, you know, the movie is kind of the journey of this character to understand that, like, oh, what I did was kind of fucked up. And uh, so that, I think, works uh, also within the the film uh, and, and in the category of authenticity because it really is tackling kind of a real-world subject in a ridiculous way. And all of that feels tonally right. Like, it doesn't feel like you're getting too off the beaten path once you once the movie starts to moralize a little bit and which is no small trick within a movie where you know a ghost kind of picks his nose uh at a certain point so you know that's kind of the the silliness that you're dealing with but it gets to a, a larger issue and a real issue i think uh facing um us culturally as as a people as a as a society um, you know, it's not the biggest ill that we have, but it's up there, you know, it's, it's one to discuss. And I think the movie does a good job of that, but it, 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 it is true to itself all through the movie. So I think authenticity great as well. Then we come to watchability is all of the above are the, the characters and the authenticity and the reasons for keeping the camera on. Does all of that add up to a movie that's watchable? That's, you know, an entertaining movie. And I think the answer to that is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very watchable film. Um, I had a good time with it. You know, and I think it, it, as I said before, it strikes an interesting balance because horror comedy is not easy. Uh, It's something we talked a lot about in the 31 Days of Halloween of how you mash up genres and sometimes that goes right and sometimes that goes wrong. And and horror comedy is a mashup of genres. Uh, They sit a little more easily alongside one another than other genres like you know doing a horror mob movie like innocent blood is a little bit tougher than a horror comedy i would argue Uh, but it still requires you know something of a deft touch to make it work and i think that dead stream isn't the funniest movie i ever saw but i think that it is a, a good time you know i wasn't laughing out loud a lot but uh, I, I was entertained the whole way through. So yeah, I think I think Deadstream is is cool. You know, it's it's a well done movie with something to say, which is nice. And uh, in the pursuit of saying that, it also manages to be entertaining. Which brings us to our last criteria, and, and one would argue uh, the most important, which is is the movie scary. And on that front, maybe not so much. There, I would give this a pretty middling grade in terms of scares. The effects work isn't bad. There's some fun stuff. Uh, and there are a variety of, you know, kind of monsters and ghosts and whatnot lurking around. So, But that's more entertaining than scary. And I don't think the movie is going for the kind of scares. Uh, you know, I mentioned this on the Discord channel that I, I watched uh, Annabelle Creation with the, the children uh, over Halloween, and it scared the shit out of them. Like, one of the kids hit the abort button about 30 minutes in and was just like, I'm not watching this. This, is, this has me way too tense. And so she bailed. The boy child stayed and watched the whole thing, but he was genuinely freaked out by the movie. And so, you know, I didn't, look, I'm not a big fan of all the Conjuring and Annabelle movies and that kind of thing, but Annabelle Creation, totally scary movie, does what it uh, what it ought to do, and and it scared the shit out of the kids, and that's all I was looking for, really. So, uh, and and my girlfriend, she was a little, <laughs> her, her exact quote after the movie was over was, I would never say this in front of the kids, but that movie kind of freaked me out. So that was really fun, uh, but... To that end, is this scary in the way that, like, Annabelle Creation is scary? No, it's more using horror. Like, I would almost liken it to Evil Dead 2, but Evil Dead 2 even has moments where it forgoes the comedy to actually be scary. And I don't think, really, there are moments like that in Deadstream. Um, So, you know, if you're looking for scares, Deadstream is probably not your guy. Uh, probably not the film for you, but in terms of being an entertaining, you know, 90 minutes of silliness with a little bit of a lesson in there, if you're looking for it, 
I think it's a good time. I think Deadstream is a, a totally effective found footage movie. And if you haven't seen it and you like found footage movies and you can handle, you know, kind of an obnoxious main character who is designed to be obnoxious. It's not just bad writing. Like he is uh, a, a YouTube personality and they nail that level of, you know, over amped excitement for the subject matter and things like that really uh like a lot of fast talking a lot of running around that kind of thing that you know it, it can be exhausting uh when you're watching some of those actual videos it's just exhausting to watch these people being jackasses and the the editing style uh is also a little bit exhausting but if that's what you're looking for out of a horror movie this movie supplies it but like i said it's got something to say about that and uh i think it works so ditch dream uh thumbs up uh on our scale of found footage tropes it does uh itself right so let's do the other shutter exclusive and then we'll we'll come back to the one that's a little more low budget a little more of a homebrew kind of you know bad ben Blackwell ghost kind of vibe to it. So uh, let's talk about VHS 99. So VHS 99 is the fifth, if you can believe that, the fifth installment in uh, the VHS series. Um, it is produced by the the people over at Bloody Disgusting, and uh, it is released by Shudder, you know, was released around Halloween. And it's, you know, it follows the same VHS tropes, right? Which is, hey, we're going to do a specific time frame, um, you know, capture some of that uh, retro DIY filmmaking magic and uh, and do it all in a style that, that uh, harkens back to the days of, you know, homemade VHS recordings and that kind of thing. And uh, so the there are five stories... Um, very briefly, uh, there is one called shredding, which is about, uh, a bunch of young punks that record themselves doing stunts. And I mean, almost the, the prelude to that YouTube channel stuff that we were talking about earlier. Um, and they're a band as well. And they decide that, uh, for one of their stunts, they're going to go, to the site of an underground club where there was a tragic fire which killed uh, a, a band uh, called Bitch Cat. And so they go to this abandoned, uh, you know, site of tragedy underground uh, and run afoul of the ghosts of the band Bitch Cat. Uh, and, you know, terror ensues. Then there's one called Suicide Bed which is uh, about a young girl who is trying to become a member of a particular sorority. Um, they, there is a legend of a, uh, a ghost that, uh, if you happen to be buried alive as this ghost was before she died, she will come and knock on your coffin. And so unsurprisingly, the hazing that this girl has to go through with this sorority um, is being buried. And the problem is, though, that once they bury her and, and they just throw a little bit of dirt on her, you know, enough to scare her. But then some police show up, scare off the sorority sisters, and then it starts raining. And it rains enough that a bunch of water and mud and shit goes into the hole. And sure enough, um, uh, the girl can't get out. The girl inside the coffin can't get out. The, the thing is filling with water and then knocks come on the coffin. And maybe the like single scariest moment of all of VHS 99 is this moment. And uh, they also give her a box of spiders, which is real fucked up. But anyway, um, the, the sorority girls come back the next day to save her. They open up the coffin and surprise, surprise, she is gone. And then all of the girls uh, then wake up in their own coffins and, you know, ghostly stuff ensues. Uh, then there is a segment called Ozzy's Dungeon, written by Flying Lotus, where you have a 
really arch and and violent kids game show um, that results in the injury of a young girl who later uh, takes revenge along with her family on the host of the uh, uh, of the children's game show, uh, which is called Ozzy's Dungeon, and of course that leads to horrific shenanigans. Um, then there's the Gawkers, which is uh, about a bunch of kids um, that uh, have a, a video camera and use it to spy on people and get more than they bargain for when they run afoul of their new sexy neighbor. Um, and then there's To Hell and Back, which is the one done by Vanessa and Joseph Winter, uh, who did Deadstream. And it is uh, sort of a Y2K thing where there's a coven of witches that are going to uh, summon a demon on the eve of the millennia. And uh, through a mistake in the ritual, a couple of guys end up in hell as opposed to documenting the summoning of this demon and then are trying to fight their way back. Um, and the wraparound is actually some animation, like stop motion stuff that one of the kids from that Gawker segment does. So it's not like that last VHS movie where you had, you know, sort of a wraparound story of, you know, cops investigating this weird cult of VHS tape distributors or something. Um, it, it's a little more loosey goosey than that. And so I'm going to do this as uh, sort of a whole when we talk about the tropes, but also uh, when we get to watchability, I think we'll, we'll talk about the individual segments and what works and what doesn't. So um, keeping the camera on, does it all make sense throughout the film? Uh, sure. Cause these are all, you know, Hey, we've got this camera. Uh, I maybe the tell hell and back uh, segment, maybe not so much just because of the, you know, the stakes of it, but that one is pretty silly. And so I don't, complain too much about the fact that you know you've got uh people recording their journey through hell and maybe shredding suffers from a little bit of that as well you know the idea that hey maybe at some point you put down the camera and just run but what are you gonna do um so then you get to characters and you know that's a real mixed bag like uh, all, most of the characters are just terrible uh, they're terrible people. Like in Shredding, there is exactly one character that is like, hey, maybe we don't go to the site of a tragedy and, and thumb our nose at it, at, you know, people who lost their lives in a horrible situation. Um, while everyone else is like, we should absolutely do that. Uh, Suicide Bid is kind of the same because you're dealing with terrible sorority sisters and even the main character who is do who is being hazed in this um even she kind of blows off her friend who's a bit of a nerd and she's like hey i don't want to be a nerd anymore i want to be a cool girl and so i guess you can make the argument well she got what she deserved but you know not a lot of people to root for in that one uh ozzy's dungeon is definitely the same way uh, where everybody in it is kind of awful. Um, and I think you know, we'll get to Ozzy's dungeon separately, but for it being the centerpiece of the movie, I find it terribly off putting. Uh, then there's the gawkers, um, and the, and kind of the same, like all the main characters are these young boys who are just trying to, you know, spy on people. There is again, exactly one character that by the way, has, has, placed hidden cameras uh not just hidden cameras but placed like spyware so that these boys can use uh, a video camera um that the girl gets uh so that they can you know spy on her and you know th there was one kid that's like maybe we shouldn't have done that and then everyone else is like what are you talking about we're gonna see this girl naked that's all we want right and so to hell and back um uh, again, the the winter's segment, uh, I think has characters that are not necessarily less likable or more likable, um, but they're a little more fleshed out. Like I, I find the girl who's really excited about becoming the vessel of Akuban, the demon to be kind of fun. And when these filmmakers get zapped into hell, they're just, 
completely hapless and uh, you know that kind of thing appeals to me they're not bad people they're just kind of dumb dumbs and that's sort of fun in that circumstance so um you know I, as you would imagine within an anthology the characters are, are kind of a mixed bag some of them are great some of them are terrible um you know i would say there are fewer characters to root for than i would like um then you get to authenticity uh, do do the movies feel authentic to themselves within the worlds that they have created is generally how we define that. And I think so for the most part. Uh, I would say that Ozzy's dungeon suffers from a little bit of just being all over the place. And you don't really know where any of it's headed until it gets there. Which could be a positive. But it also is just so unpleasant that it, it makes you not want to see it uh, through to the end. Um, I would say, you know, To Hell and Back is the other one that might have issues with authenticity. Uh, there, There is some argument about the makeup of Hell as you have described it in To Hell and Back. Um, but again, it makes its own interior logic uh, within the story. So I'm not going to complain too much about that. It's, it's tough to say, you know, like chart the authenticity through these five five stories. But I would say for the most part, they work. Like there are very few times when I was watching where I was like, well, this doesn't feel like it would happen in a movie like this. Uh, again, you know, you're dealing with such short narratives and such, you know, tight plot loops that it's not really a big problem. Um, then you get to watchability. So let's talk about these individually. Like what, what stories work and what stories don't, uh, shredding, I think is the most routine of the movies that and suicide bid, like the, the, the two movies they put up front are the exact kinds of movies you, uh, are stories you would expect to find in VHS 99 where, Hey, some people, you know, trample on, uh, the, the graves of, some ghosts that don't want their graves trampled on. Um, and I, I think it's okay. Shredding is okay. Suicide bid is okay. Although suicide bid is shorter and has probably the best scare of the movie. So suicide bid, I would definitely rank higher than I would shredding. Uh, shredding feels very routine. It does. It does not feel like there's much that distinguishes it from, I, again, like if you were going to tell me that, hey, there's a story in a VHS 99 movie about some people that run afoul of a demonic rock band and the rock band ends up killing these people and et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, okay, that fe that feels totally like something that would happen in a VHS segment. Uh, likewise with Suicide Bid, but it, it's pretty well done. Johannes, Johannes Roberts is responsible for that. And there's some scary stuff in it. Um, also helped by the fact that it is short. Uh, then you get to Ozzy's Dungeon, which is the Flying Lotus segment. And I almost quit the movie. In fact, I did. It took me two sits to watch it because Ozzy's Dungeon, I found so off-putting. Both the, the direction of it, the editing of it. I just didn't care about any of this. Maybe if I'd grown up at a different time when... You know, like these like, sort of Nickelodeon shows about kids running through obstacle courses or something. But even then, like, I'm aware of those things. And I, I can certainly uh, use my imagination to to cast myself into the role of a fan of those shows. I just think Ozzy's Dungeon is gross. And not gross in the sense that, like, everything's disgusting. Although there's some disgusting stuff in it. Um... It's just gross to watch. It looks bad. It sounds bad. The editing is is choppy. It's just off-putting. And I really hated it. Like, Ozzy's Dungeon was the thing that made me turn off VHS 99. And then I came back to it just because it's the also one of the longest segments. And boy, you feel every minute of it. It is unendurable. But on the other side of Ozzy's Dungeon, there are a couple of more segments that aren't as long and are much better, but it's terrible. Ozzy's dungeon. I, you know, I didn't watch the other flying Lotus movie that shutter did. Uh, and this did not sell me on the idea that flying Lotus is actually a good director. It just 
made me nauseous to watch it. And again, not because of like there's gross like you know poo and pee stuff in it, and that's not the thing that made it difficult to watch or made me feel disgusted. It's just the way that it looks. It, it's just so grungy and ugly. And, uh, you know, when you're doing a thing called Ozzy's Dungeon that's about a kid's, uh, you know, obstacle course style game show, it should be colorful and bright. And even if your camera work is, you know, just nonstop movement, like, God knows that <laughs> Flying Lotus never heard of a tripod. Uh, but it, I, I just, I hated it. I hated the way it looked. I hated the story. I hated the way it played out. I, I hated the editing of it. I hated the music of it. It just, all of it, every bit of it was something I did not want to watch. And your mileage may vary on that one, but I thought Ozzy's Dungeon was, uh, you know, like I said, it, I had to come back to it. I could not sit through all of Ozzy's Dungeon. I made about halfway through it and I was like, I don't like watching this. This is stupid. Um, and that's that's such a like a, a dismissive thing to say about a segment, and it and it oversimplifies the argument and all of that. But that's how I felt about. It. I was just like, I don't like this. I don't like watching it. It may it, my life is too short to spend watching something like Ozzy's Dungeon that feels borderline incompetent. So anyway, that is my rant about Ozzy's Dungeon. I hated it. Oh, I hated it so much. Then there's the Gawkers, which kind of falls back into the, hey, if you told me there was going to be a segment in something called VHS 99, where some kids who, you know, take over the webcam of a sexy lady next door, and it turns out that she is some kind of monster, then I'll be like, all right, that sounds right. And that's exactly how I felt about the Gawkers. Uh, very middling. It, it's it's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, I don't think the CGI is particularly good uh, when you get to the monster part of things. And the payoff is so quick that you're like, oh, okay. I get it, I guess. And there was room to do something a little more creative with it, I think. Uh, and, and the movie's just not, you know, smart enough or deft enough or it, that's just not the way it went. Um, this was done by Tyler McIntyre, who was a director I really like, who did, you know, Patchwork and, and Tragedy Girls and a uh, number of, of really good movies. Um, and I just don't think this is very good. But that is a fine reminder I should go back and watch uh, Patchwork, because I think Patchwork is, uh, is terrific. Um, okay, so the final segment is To Hell and Back. This is done by the winners, who did Deadstream. And it is uh, the boldest of them. Uh, here's the thing. I'm a sucker for something that tries to give you a view of hell. And done on a budget like this, I think it's a pretty fun look at, um, you know, what hell could be or a version of hell. And there's uh, 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 Melanie Stone who is Chrissy in the uh, Deadstream film, uh, plays a demon named Mabel. And I find that very, very funny. Uh, she's like, sees these guys on, on this plane of existence and it has almost this like Shakespearean style of speech. Uh, she very puckish from like Midsummer Night's Dream in a lot of ways. And is just like, you know, guiding them through the experience but is also a little bit confused as to why they do not want to consume the flesh of others uh and and it's fun like to hell and back is a good time uh i found it to be the most enjoyable of them all and maybe that's because it's a little bit uh a little bit bolder than some of them uh you know it's it's painting on a bigger canvas and feels like something other than what you would expect in a movie like this. You know, like I, I've said a number of times, like if you told me this segment was going to be in a, a movie called VHS 99, I would totally believe you and that would be, you know, completely expected. And to Helen Beck feels a little unexpected and it feels a little bit um, more interesting uh, than than the others. And I really uh, enjoyed it. I think it's one of the, the segments, even though, even if you don't watch some of the other stuff, and I would tell you... Uh, to skip over that uh, Flying Lotus segment entirely. But I would definitely say you should watch the To Hell and Back segment, 
because it's kind of fun. It's a little, a little silly, uh, but you know, anytime someone wants to show me what their version of hell is, I, I, I think that's a good time. And I like the the coven of witches who are just very matter of fact about like, oh yeah, we're going to summon a demon and it's going to be great. And then there's a, a bit of a, a callback at the end of the credits. Uh, so I would encourage you to, you know, skip ahead to watch the, uh, the, the tag on to hell and back. Cause it's kind of a fun payoff. Um, okay. So that's watchability. Let's get to scares. Um, none of this is terribly scary other than there were some moments in suicide bid that I think, uh, uh, do a good job in ratcheting up the tension and doing a good payoff of, you know, th this idea of like, hey, when you're trapped in this coffin, something's going to come calling. And, you know, I think that's fun. Uh, the director, by the way, of that segment is the same guy who did 47 Meters Down and then recently did that new Resident Evil movie, Welcome to Raccoon City, which we did on Dark Parade and which I didn't find terrible. Uh, I thought it was exactly what it should have been. And, um, you know, that's why I say like Suicide Bid is exactly what you would expect in a movie like VHS 99, but it's a pretty good one of those. Um, so that's about the only scare you're going to get out of this. I don't think there's anything particularly scary in any of the other segments. Uh, but you know, to recap, uh, our, our look at VHS 99 writ large, um, shredding is okay. Suicide bid is like a B plus. Ozzy's Dungeon is an F minus. <laughs> the Gawkers is like a total C, C minus. And Tell and Back is like another B plus just because it's kind of fun. So real shaky. I think, I think the end result is, it, it's hard to say because there are a couple of segments. I'm like, you put these in another VHS movie and I think it's pretty good. Um, I, I think that, boy, that, uh, that Flying Lotus, Ozzy's Dungeon segment just drags the whole thing down uh but it's okay the the whole the end result of all of it is like a real middling kind of entry but there are some high points i think i think suicide bid and to hell and back in particular are worth your time you you should watch those if nothing else and finally we come to uh the last of our three films uh that we're doing here on uh the, this year episode of the found footage full um and we're talking about a movie called uh, Leaving DC, which if uh, if you are completely unfamiliar and there's no reason for you to be familiar with it, um, it is a, a, a very DIY, very indie kind of uh, found footage movie um, about a guy, uh, that, written and directed, by the way, by Josh Chris, who also stars in it, so it's one of those, right? Like, when I compare it to something like, you know, Blackwell Ghost or um, the Bad Ben movies, it's very much of that stripe of, like, it is basically a dude and some friends of his making this movie, but, um, and, and minimalist in the same ways of, like, hey, there are ghosts, but... But you're not going to see a whole lot of stuff. It's going to be very, you know, theater of the mind uh, kind of business. Uh, the budget on this was about a buck twenty-five. Um, but the premise of it I like, which is uh, the main character of the film, uh, as played by writer, director, and editor Josh Chris, um, is this guy named Mark Klein. He has... Uh, left Washington, D.C., as the title implies. He's a technical writer. And decided that he was he was done with the city, wanted to get out, and um, ends up buying a house in South Carolina, or Virginia, maybe it's Virginia, because it's close enough for him to drive back to D.C. At any rate, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's like a house on 17 acres, and... Um, you know, the closest town is 35 minutes away and, you know, that kind of thing. He, like, wants to, to get out amongst nature, be out of the rat race and all of that. And, of course, uh, when he moves in, uh, weird things start to happen. Um, he, the the movie is is done in the style of, hey, I am doing reports for this support group that I'm in. And the implication is that 
he was uh, depressed and potentially suicidal and was in sort of an emotional support group. And so he's making these videos for them. And, um, you know, talks about like, hey, when I come to D.C. next, I, you know, we're all going to get together and have a meeting and, and so forth. Uh, so weird stuff starts happening to the tune of hearing um, what sounds like uh, people chopping trees real close to his place. And he starts, you know, doing nightly audio recordings to try to uh, figure out where the sound is coming from and if it's close. And then discovers that somebody is also playing the flute uh, in a creepy fashion out in the woods. And, you know, so a lot of the movie is sort of him scrubbing through audio and and some pictures and finding creepy stuff there uh the the benefit of it is that the movie is not an hour and 20 minutes long so it doesn't really overstay its welcome which is good and there's a moment in the movie where he ends up going to um uh, he invites a, a girl from the support group that he maybe likes and maybe she likes him but uh, things don't go well because immediately she starts hearing stuff and he is also not great with women. Like he, he's a very awkward dude and I don't know if that's Josh Chris or if he is talented enough to write and perform in a way that makes this guy seem very, very awkward and a little, I mean, almost on the spectrum in terms of how he deals with with people. And uh, so let's get to it. Let's let's talk about uh, the five tropes here. Um, first, uh, what about keeping the cameras on? Uh, uh, are we holding our own in that respect? And I would say uh, absolutely yes. Because, you know, the whole thing is him kind of documenting the creepy stuff that is happening around him. And I think that's really effective. It's really well done. I'm a fan of, like, uh, epistolary novels. Uh, like Frankenstein and Dracula and that kind of thing. I really like uh, that format and, you know, found footage when done in certain ways is is sort of the filmic version of that epistolary novel. And and that's what Leaving DC is. It's, it's very much of that ilk. Um, and then we get to the characters. There's really only one character in the whole movie. There's, uh, there's Mark Klein. And then there's Claire for a hot second, but she's not in the movie uh, for t too awful long. Because soon, as soon as she hears some weird shit, she's like, I'm getting out of here, and leaves the next morning. So you're kind of left with Mark. And I think the, the thing that makes Mark a, a compelling character is that he does seem so fallible. He seems very wounded. Um, you know, at times he, he's kind of exasperated and, and upset, and sometimes he... You know, one night he gets a little too drunk just to try to get, uh, you know, his uh, a good night's sleep in. Which, as we all know, drinking does not lead to a good night's sleep. It just leads to waking up hungover. Um, but, yeah, it, you know, he, he's a little hapless uh, out in the woods alone like this. Um, and, you know, he, he's a compelling enough character... And capable enough, like he does smart things like, hey, I'm going to set up these game cameras and see if I can figure out what's going on. I'm going to use my digital recorder and see if I can figure out what's going on. Um, he is resistant to the idea that anything is supernatural, uh, although he does explore that as well. He's like, look, you know, at one point, especially after all the flute business, he kind of gives uh, his theories as to what's going on. And one of them is the supernatural. He's like, here's the one that I think is the least likely, but I have to consider it because the other stuff isn't adding up. And so I like that about it. And um, which brings us kind of to the authenticity of the movie. And I think that it feels like if you were going to have something like this happen in the really real world, uh, I think it would probably go something like this. Um, one of the things about it is that it doesn't entirely explain itself. Based on the information that you have, you can kind of put together what the haunting is, but not entirely. Some of it still feels a little mysterious. And I, and I like that. You know, when, when the movie ended, I was like, I'm not 
entirely sure I understand every bit of this, and I think that's probably for the best. Um, and there's this element uh, that runs through it of like how Mark deals with women. Um, it happens both with Claire and in theory with the ghost that is haunting him because, uh, as his online buddy points out, it's probably a female ghost since they are more likely to haunt the places near where they died. And, you know, it, like it, you could say that his ultimate fate is tied to the way that he, you know, learns or doesn't learn how to deal with women. Uh, or, or treat women with with something like respect and dignity. Um, and anyway, so that's authenticity stuff. Uh, the watchability, I, look, I'm a sucker for this kind of movie. This kind of found, found footage movie of, hey, I moved into this house, weird stuff is happening, and I'm going to document it, and you as the viewer are going to come along on this mystery. And like I said, the fact that it is not an hour and 20 minutes long... Uh, speaks to why I think the movie is better than it could be. Like, if, if this thing were 90 minutes, we'd probably be in real trouble. But as it stands, it, it kind of does its business and gets out in a reasonable amount of time. And I think I, I think it totally works. Um, and then you get to the scares. And is the movie scary? Um, and that's a tough one to answer because it's not out and out scary, but I would say that it's eerie, uh, for a movie like this. It's, it's sort of a ghost story well told. And, uh, and I don't know that I want to say much more than that because there's so much tied up, uh, in terms of the plot. And I, w I would recommend that you watch this. I, you can find it on, on, Amazon for 99 cents if you want to rent it. So if you want to spend a buck on a found footage movie that you likely have not seen before and you might enjoy, again, if you like those uh, Bad Ben style films, I think this is a superior version of that kind of thing. Um, where it's it's very obviously a homemade movie, but I think it it does more with the premise than Bad Ben does or the original Bad Ben. At some point we'll do that on this show, but... Um, yeah, so I think leaving DC, leaving DC, is legitimately pretty good. Uh, I don't think it's amazing, but it was creepy enough that as I was watching it on a cool October night and uh, and picking through some Halloween candy, I was like, you know what, this this felt like the right decision. I will recommend it to you with that kind of caveat of it's not terrifying, but it is creepy in a way that I really liked and I there's part of me that wishes I could see this movie done with a bigger budget but then when I start to think about what you might do with that budget I change my mind because it ends in a way that is perhaps a little bit unsatisfying but also I don't know how I would end it or I would want it to end in a more satisfying way because as soon as you start answering some of those questions it becomes slightly less creepy so you know uh drop by the discord and and let me know uh if you have seen it and if so what what you thought of it um and speaking of hey uh if you want to uh drop by and say hello if you go to legionpodcasts.com you can uh find this here post uh on this show uh, or, you know, any of the Dark Parade. If you go to legionpodcast.com and then click on the shows, uh, you'll see a listing for the Dark Parade. You click on that, and it'll show you every show that we've done. On any of those posts, you'll find a link to the Discord server. And uh, please drop by and say hello, because that's where I tend to, to be. That's where I tend to lurk. Uh, but you'll also find, you know, the Facebook group and Twitter and stuff like that. Although, I, I don't even check in Twitter anymore now that it is an Elon Musk owned vehicle. I'm just like, you know what? I don't need to be any part of this. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's just personal stuff, right? Like I, I don't like Elon Musk. I don't like his, uh, I like the fact that he's bold and he's a visionary. I don't like the fact that his level of wealth allows him to interfere in society and politics. 
You know, he should just be a weirdo inventor that does weirdo inventor stuff. Like, going to space and all that, that's fine. But the second you start buying up platforms that influence the way that culture behaves, I, that's where I, I get a little dicey. So I would rather not participate. But uh, so far, so good with the Discord. So <laughs> feel free to drop uh, by there. And uh, and we've got more coming this month, folks. Um, we got uh, not just Found Footage Full, which you're listening to now. We've got a Heart of Horror. We're going to do a What You Watching. There's going to be a regular episode with Richard Glenn Schmidt coming uh, that I think we're going to have a lot of fun with. So all that stuff is in the not-too-distant future, uh, dropping on the weekly here in November. Uh, so more to come. Uh, thanks for being patient through the 31 days of Halloween. Again, I hope you enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, buckle in. We got uh, lots more on the way. And as always, thank you for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time.